said Neil Graham is my name. I um, uh, am uh, CEO of uh, CLANS, the patient support group I, I was involved in setting up about, uh, it, well, the idea started about um, uh, just under two years ago. And um, this evening is the inaugural event, uh, a live event for CLANS, which is uh, a New Zealand's uh, patient advocate group for CLL. Um, I have CLL and I felt there was a need uh, a few years ago for a specific patient support group for the disease itself. And with uh, the help of a lot of other people, um, clans were started and it. Uh, the first year was involved with um, the infrastructure and putting it all together and we, we've done all that by the beginning of this year and CLANS has been an active entity uh, for all of um, 2020. Um, there's lots of similar patient support groups all over the world and we've made a, a, a specific job of um, uh, networking with these groups and we've got to know them well and we've had a lot of good ideas from them. And um, we planned a launch event uh, that was going to happen earlier this year. But of course, as you know, COVID came along. And uh, so it was put off for six months or so, but it's all on tonight. And I hope you're going to have a very really informative and very good uh, experience at, at, the, at the seminar. So this is our first live event and it's therefore our launch. And um, I thank uh, LBC for their uh, provision of the facilities for the meeting and particularly Tim and his colleagues for all the good work they've done in putting the meeting together and getting you people here and the people out there uh, in other parts of the country and perhaps as Tim said optimistically, other parts of the world might be linking in, who knows. The other thing I meant, uh, I wanted to mention is this is also the launch of our book. Now, there's a bit of a story behind this because LBC have also produced a book that, that looks very uh, uh, similar in size. And uh, we, we didn't really know each other was putting this book together until both projects were well advanced. So we decided we'd do both. I mean, there's a lot of duplication within them, but there's a, a complementary nature, I think, anyway, to the two books. And so I think you'll find both of them useful and both of them informative and valuable for you people as patients. So um, without further ado, uh, we have three speakers tonight. And the first one is uh, Peter Broad, who's professor of pathology at, at Auckland University and a clinical hematologist at the Auckland Hospital. And Peter's gonna talk about CLL, the disease. Thank you, Peter. And here's the, yeah, yeah, here it is here. It's a tricky little one to, oh, I'm, Tim's got the idea. Well, I think we're just, just to say we'll have maybe time for a, a couple of questions at the end of each talk, specific to the talk, and then we're going to have a panel discussion at the end uh, for um, general questions and general discussion. Yeah, Peter, thank you. Thanks, Neil. So, so um, my name is, is Peter Brout. I'm a hematologist and look after patients with, uh, with CLL, but I also at the, at the University of Auckland and so we have a research group working on, really, I guess, our interest is around the genetics of, uh, of leukemia. So my role is to set the scene talking a little bit about what CLL is uh, and some of the newer concepts around the, the biology and particularly the genetics of it, which is going to influence the, the comments that the subsequent speakers will make around uh, treatment sort of choices. So I suspect that I'm talking to the converters, you know what, what CLL is, but, but chronic lymphocytic leukemia, it actually has the wrong name. And uh, although we call it a leukemia, 
uh, the, the key words are chronic and, and lymphocytic. And I think if we were starting again, I'd, you know, it is a blood cancer, I'm not ignoring that, but I think a name of a, of a, of a chronic lymphoproliferative neoplasm or chronic lymphoproliferative cancer would be better words, because I think the key words are around the, the, the chronic, whereas when we think of leukemia, we think of acute leukemia, which is quite a different disease in its behavior. Not to say that it's not a serious disease, it doesn't have significant implications for people, but I think it reflects the, uh, its behavior. So we call this a lymphoproliferative uh, disorder. It's a cancer and it's accumulation of monoclonal cells. Monoclonal cells means that all those cells are the same. So they're all are derived from a cell that's got the same genetic signature and its daughter cells or son cells are exactly the same and their daughter cells are the same. So that's a clonal population. And that's a feature of any cancer, be it a melanoma or a breast cancer, is that the cells are all clonal. And those cells accumulate in the bone marrow, they spill over into the peripheral blood as shown here, and then they can accumulate in lymph nodes and also in the, in the spleen and sometimes in, in other sites as well. It's a bone marrow de de uh, derived uh, sort of cancer. So the bone marrow is, it's really our blood factory. So when you look at the bones and here's the femur, here's that spongy part of the, uh, the bone and that's where the bone marrow is. And normally in that we have the bone marrow stem cells or the blood stem cells. So that's the cell that grows in to all the normal uh, blood cells that circulate in your peripheral blood. And if we focus down on those, so here's the stem cell, here's a myeloid stem cell that develops into the neutrophils and platelets and red blood cells, and down this side into the lymphocytes, so the B and the T uh, lymphocytes. And chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a malignancy of these mature um, B lymphocytes. And that's the cells that we see circulating in the peripheral blood. We now actually think though, that although this is the cell that we see, that perhaps the first event is occurring back in that uh, stem cell rather than this, uh, this cell here. So that's why we say it's a bone marrow uh, derived uh, neoplasm or malignancy. It's the most common cancer that we see in New Zealand and the most common leukemia that we see in New Zealand and other uh, Western countries, where it's much less frequent in developing countries and in, uh, in Asian countries. And it's interesting when we look across Auckland is that I work at Auckland Hospital, so our demographics have changed and that we've got a much bigger Asian population living in that central Auckland area now. So we see less CLL in our centre than presents at North Shore and, uh, and Middlemore. It's around uh, four to five cases per 100,000 population. And the median age of onset is in that 70, 75 years uh, of age. And like many conditions and many of the blood cancers, there's a slight uh, predominance in males. And we don't know why that is. This is UK data and it just presents nicely the age distribution. So the blue is uh, male cases, the pink is female uh, cases. Uh, and that's his age along the, the x-axis. And you can see this peak in the 70 to 75 years of, uh, of age. These curves represent the accumulative uh, incidence. So although overall that incidence is around four to 100,000 population, it actually becomes uh, a higher uh, incidence when we look at the, an older population uh, group. How do, we, how do we know, or how do we make that diagnosis of uh, CLL? I just want to talk about this because it leads on to the, uh, to the, next, uh, to the next stage of my sort of talk. Uh, but the diagnosis, the two key th the t tests or parts of it are looking at the peripheral blood and looking at the morphology of the lymphocytes. So patients, often it's an incidental finding done on a blood count for another reason that the lymphocyte count is found to be significantly elevated. And when the hematologist looks at that under the microscope, they find these mature lymphocytes. So these are the, the, uh, the CLL cells, 
they've got this clumped chromatin. So that's the sort of the darker color with the, the nucleus. So this is the nucleus, the sort of the intelligence part of the cell. And this is the cytoplasm and it's just a thin rim of cytoplasm. And so there's characteristic features and many hematologists will make a diagnosis just looking at the, uh, at the peripheral blood. But it needs to be confirmed to, to differentiate it because there are other chronic lymphoproliferative conditions like hairy cell leukemia or lymphoma with circulating uh, as, um, lymphoma cells. And so the other test that, that we would do and that you may have heard of or heard the results would be flow cytometry or cell marker studies. And that's to look at the immunophenotype of the cells. So I've just shown this in a diagram. This is looking at these are T lymphocytes, but all the cells in our body express a range of uh, proteins. So be it your lymphocytes or be it uh, epithelial cells on your skin. And we can, we can test for those with antibodies that recognize those proteins, but not different proteins. And, and we take the antibodies, they have a fluorescent label uh, on them. And so, if you've got an antibody that recognizes a protein on a T cell or a B cell, it'll stick onto that protein and stick onto the cell. And then we put it through the flow cytometer, which basically shines a laser light through the cells as they move through the, the flow chamber. And then if that antibody with the fluorescent marker on it is still stuck onto the cell, it will fluoresce and that will be picked up uh, by the detection system. And you can then, if it fluoresces, then you know that it's expressing that protein that uh, was reactive with the antibody. And in patients with, with CLL is that we look for a monoclonal population. So we do that because all the cells express one part of a protein called the immunoglobulin gene. And then there's expression of this protein called CD5, which is normally only seen on T cells, it shouldn't be on your B cells. And these are all B cell markers here. So this combination is characteristic for BCLL. And so these are the two critical tests that are used in the diagnosis of a patient uh, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia to make the diagnosis. Sometimes we do a bone marrow. Sometimes we scan depending on the symptoms uh, and findings in a patient. One of the new findings is that although we thought that everybody who had these abnormal CLL-like cells in the blood had chronic lymphocytic leukemia, it's now been recognized that all patients have a preceding pre-malignant phase called where there's these small numbers of lymphocytes in the peripheral blood, and that over time that evolves into well. In many patients, this, this early phase is not recognized, but it's the finding of, it's gonna go back a slide, it's the finding of cells that look like this, that have this particular protein expression pattern on the, uh, on the lymphocytes but they're at a very low number. And the number that's been defined uh, by groups that look at this is when those lymphocytes are less than five times 10 to the nine per liter. So CLL is when the lymphocyte count is greater than five. If it's less than five, it's called monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. And this is thought to be a pre-malignant condition that precedes the development of CLL. Shown in the diagram, so here's the blood stem cell, the, the lightning strikes are mutations, which I'm gonna talk about shortly, that, that alter the growth of the cells. Here we've got the first event occurs and we've got a proliferation of these clonal B cells, but at a low level. And then over time, it can evolve into, uh, into CLL. What's interesting is that when people have done population studies is that about 5% of the, uh, the, the healthy population will have this monoclonal B cell population. And about one to 2% of those each year 
will progress through into, uh, into CLL. So that's a new finding, a new addition to our understanding of how CLL develops and a newly recognized condition over the last uh, uh, several years. So we've defined what, what CLL is and we've, we've defined how we make that diagnosis. So the next question is, well, what causes it? Why did you develop uh, CLL? Because we know cigarette smoking is associated with lung cancer. We know UV exposure associated with the development of skin cancers and melanoma. And we really haven't identified any clear environmental risk factor or exposure that leads to the development of CLL. There are lots of studies looking at occupational exposures and they're ongoing, but, it, but at the moment we don't have, I can't say oh, it's because of that exposure and the horticultural industry exposure to those sprays that have resulted. We, don't, we haven't recognized uh, as such a clear environmental risk factor. What we have recognized though is that in CLL, every, those CLL cells in, in patients, they all have a number of mutations in the CLL cells. So these are spelling mistakes that occur in the code or in the, in the DNA of the CLL cells. And that's important in the development of the CLL. Secondly is that we know that it's not just in the CLL cells, but it's where they sit. So the bone marrow and the lymph nodes, what's called the microenvironment, that's important. And there is, and many of you may have re recognized this, that, that you've got aunts or uncles or cousins that have also had CLL or perhaps even a parent or, or a sibling that has CLL or lymphoma. And it is recognized that there is a risk, and particularly in the first degree relatives of a patient with CLL. And the literature suggests this may be as high as an eight times greater risk uh, than compared to the general population. If I can talk about that a little bit more is that because of that family risk is that lots of groups have looked at those families to see is there a gene, is there something we can test for? And on the right is uh, Angelina Jolie who has got a family history of breast and ovarian cancer and carries the BRCA1 gene. And so in breast cancer, about 5% of uh, cases are familial and are linked to inheritance of either BRCA1 or BRCA2. And the same in colon cancer and some forms of stomach cancer. In CLL, although there's the family link, no single gene, despite many, many labs looking at this, no single predisposition gene has been identified that we can test for. It's likely to be a whole set of genes. And the latest data is suggesting there may be around 40 to 50 genes that, that we all carry and we'll all have those variations and perhaps the interaction of several of those along with environmental factors leads to the development of, uh, of CLL. And although I said that risk is increased uh, around eightfold, it's still a very, very low risk. Uh, and so there is no recommendation for family screening or, uh, or sort of testing. How then do people get picked up with uh, CLL? Because it leads on to the, the comment I want to make about, about how we assess the CLL in greater depth. So most patients, uh, it, it's, off, it's an incidental uh, sort of finding as part of a routine blood test. But the presentations are an increase in the uh, lymphocyte count in the blood, leading to reduction in these production of these normal blood cells and proliferation of the cells and the lymphatics in the body resulting enlargement of lymph nodes. And this diagram just shows the different sites of lymph nodes in the neck and the axilla. And we include in that lymphatic system the liver and spleen as well. So frequently patients with CLL will have a peripheral blood lymphocytosis, uh, lymph nodes that are enlarged, and the spleen may be enlarged as well. So those are the, clinical, the main clinical features of CLL along with systemic or constitutional features such as weight loss and 
unexplained uh, sort of tiredness. But in fact, 70% of patients when they're first present and first diagnosed uh, are asymptomatic and at an early stage of their disease don't have suppression of their blood counts and don't have any significant uh, lymphadenopathy. And so how then we make the diagnosis, how then do we know what's going to happen? How can we, what information have we got that predicts for you know, the future need for treatment and then when treatment is required, likely response to treatment? And I guess it comes under that term we use as uh, clinicians of, you know, the prognosis of the, uh, the disease. So traditionally, we've used clinical staging. And so your clinicians may have spoken to you about uh, your blood counts and the size of your lymph nodes and have talked about the rye staging and the Binet staging, which have been around for around uh, 40 years. But we've moved on in the last decade and we're adding to that information around genetic changes in the CLL cells, changes in the immunoglobulin gene, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, and putting those all together along with those clinical factors to really give you, you know, to give, to give the clinician, to give the patient, give their family better information about what's going to happen. And finally, I just wanna to touch briefly on this concept of how we define a response to treatment and the concept of minimal or measurable uh, residual disease. So the whole of the cancer world, uh, actually, let me take a step back from that. If you say, what are the biggest discoveries in the cancer area in the last uh, four or five years? And there's two. One's been around cancer immunotherapy. And Rob Weinkoff is going to talk about that, I hope. <laughs> a little bit. So that understanding the immunology of the cancer. The second is understanding the genetic changes that occur in the cancer. And it's led to this concept of personalized hematology because we see people with CLL or acute leukemia uh, and it looks the same under the microscope. It looks the same uh, seeing the patient. But why does why does one patient behave in a particular way and not need any treatment and another patient, the disease is growing and needs active treatment very early on? What's that difference for something that looks very similar under the microscope? And it's given rise to this concept of personalized medicine, personalized hematology, of being able to look at the DNA of the cell. So here's, here's a cell, here's, here's the DNA. So that's the genetic code in the cell. It's like a book of instructions, and these are the chromosomes. So the chromosomes are like the book, and the genes and are like the chapters in the book, and then the DNA is like those sentences in the book. And in every cancer, and, and including in CLL, we see mistakes where either pages are ripped out of the book, or some of the words are swapped around on each uh, page, and those are the things that drive the, uh, the cancer. And we're getting better at looking at those. So the things that are in the clinic at the moment are looking at the chromosomes. Uh, so that's at this part here. So looking at the book and the chapters. And so many of you, if you've had CLL, uh, your clinician may have arranged for you to have fish studies. You think, what the heck am I having fish studies for when I've got CLL? So fish isn't a fish. FISH stands for fluorescence in situ hybridization. So what we do here is we take a bit of the DNA, we put another fluorescent label on it, and then it sticks on to the DNA in your CLL cells. So here it is here, here's your CLL cell, here's the bit that might have a change. We take our probe, we add the fluorescent label to it, it sticks on to your normal or abnormal piece of DNA, and it's hard to see here, these red dots, these are individual cells. These red dots are the fluorescence for where it's picking up the gene we're looking at. And we routinely in CLL look at four different uh, um, uh, genes by fish. And chromosome 13 deletion, seen about the half the patients with CLL. Trisomy 12, that's an additional copy of chromosome 12. 
uh, chromosome 11 abnormalities and 17, uh, chromosome 17 abnormalities. And this is clinically when we look at, when we analyze patient data, we look at uh, what are called Kaplan-Meier survival curves. So that the probability of a patient remaining in remission or probability of the longevity of the patient. So this is on the y-axis, the percentage of patients surviving. This is months or years along the x-axis. So here you can see these ones, patients are doing really well, you know, though most patients, you know, their survival oops, is, um, is over the, you know, out over uh, 10 to 12 years except for this group here with abnormalities of uh, chromosome 17, which is where the P53 gene sits. P53 gene is like a molecular policeman, and it's important for getting rid of uh, abnormal cells. So when it's mutated, those cells survive. So we routinely look for this, and it's an important marker, and patients with that don't respond as well to our conventional therapies, and Pharmac have now funded the newer therapy, uh, venetoclax, in this setting. And the new advance is that if the fish is negative, we will sequence the, the T53 gene. So we look by fish, and then we sequence that as well. This just shows this is the impact of TP53. So the wild type is the normal. This is the mutation. So you can see patients don't do so well if they've got a T53 mutation, but they do respond to the novel agents, the BTK inhibitor of brucinib and venetoclax, and venetoclax has recently been funded for patients that have got the 17P uh, deletion. All we're doing here, though, is looking at four genes, and the world's moved on. This is Stefan Boland, who's a colleague of mine in our lab in the Leukemia and Blood Cancer Research Unit. So when we started doing those fish studies, we could look at a small amount of the, the genome, whereas now with this machine here, we can sequence the entire human genome in a day. It takes us a bit longer to analyze it. And Stefan gave me these slides, he's German. It's a bit like going, uh, the fish, is like, fish studies are like a bicycle. The genome sequencing is like the Starship Enterprise at warp speed. And somewhere in between, we've got a Mercedes Benz. Uh, so, We've moved, this is the fish, but in fact, there's a lot more complexity in your CLL cells, and that's what we're starting to do. And there's a lot of studies, I'm just showing you one. This is from the German leukemia study group, where they looked at 538 patients with CLL. They sequenced all the coding regions of the gene. So this is patients across the top, so each one down there. This is the genes down here, and each dot is a different mutation. And so the thing to see is that each patient has got a different set of genes mutated. So why would we expect then each patient to respond exactly the same way to, uh, to the gene? This is some of the genes, and this is the percentage. So these uh, that are mutated, so some of them are very uncommon mutations. This is not in the clinic as yet, but it will be moving into the, you know, it's going to be in the next four or five years. The information from this study will, uh, will become, will inform our treatment because each of those mutations activates a different pathway within, uh, within the CLL cell. So it's a bit like having your computer and looking at the motherboard. If you get a bit that's broken, how do you know if it's this bit or this bit or this bit? because you need a different fix and a different drug for this bit or this bit. And just giving everybody the same, they're not all going to respond the same. So that's where we're moving to. I'm getting the word from the chairman, but I'm moving quickly. So, so first thing that, that helps us is those molecular studies and particularly the fish studies. The second is what's called the immunoglobulin mutation status. So if you look at the literature, if you look at patient websites overseas, you'll see they'll say, well, are you mutated or non-mutated? And Neil always, when I see him ask, am I mutated or non -mutated? He asks whether he's mutated, I'm not mutated. Um, <laughs> so what that means, B cells are part of the immune system. They mature into cells that make antibodies. So when you get immunized against influenza or measles or in the future COVID, you are generating an immune response. 
And the reason that, that your antibody responds to either COVID or to influenza is this bit here, the variable region. And so that puts in different uh, nucleotides in the gene and different amino acids in there so that it recognizes that. In CLL, we recognize two subtypes, a group where this part of the immunoglobulin gene is not mutated and a group where it is mutated. And it probably relates to how the CLL forms. And so this is the mutated, it probably has gone through a lymph node and been exposed to anti an antigen or antigens so that you get more variation in this VH region of the immunoglobulin gene. And we call that immunoglobulin gene mutated. And then there's a group that skipped that and they're non-mutated and they have a quite different prognosis. Mutated, much better prognosis. Non-mutated have a less favorable prognosis. So we need to do something different with, uh, with treatment. And so we're looking to put the, the traditional clinical staging, so the RISE stage, along with the genetic staging marker, so the mutation status of the immunoglobulin gene, TP53 and 17P deletion status and putting those into scoring systems. And this is looking at patients at diagnosis, how long, how many treatment free uh, survival before. So number of patients that didn't need treatment at five years following diagnosis. So if you don't, if you don't have a TP53 and have a, a mutated gene, you know, you're low risk and so a lower chance of progressing. Final thing, minimal residual disease. So at the moment, when you have treatment and you come and you see me and I say, well, you've responded well to treatment, your blood count looks fine, can't fill any lymph nodes, you know, we call that a remission. But in fact, we know that there is still a significant amount of leukemia cells there. And so there's a big move to looking for how can you spot cells, not just down to one in 20 or one in 100, but like the Where's Wally, and he's here, is that uh, how can we spot that one in a million? And it's the concept of minimal residual disease. And we can do this by flow cytometry, where we can pick down to one in, uh, in 10,000, or by molecular strategies up to one in 100,000. Uh, and that gives much more powerful information. This is uh, some results from uh, Spanish CLL group looking at patients that had FCR treatment. And these are patients with low levels of MRD, uh, medium, and then still s significant residual disease. And you can see this is time to progression. You can see if you're negative by MRD, much better duration of uh, remission. So my final slide is that you know, there's a lot of advances in, uh, in CLL, and it's particularly around that genetics and biology. We're learning about the impact of, of TP53 and the 17P deletion, the immunoglobulin gene status. And what I forgot to say is that this is available. We test for routinely for this in New Zealand. This is an omission. Uh, our lab is working on setting this up, but it's not available at the moment in New Zealand labs. There's one lab in Australia that is, uh, that is doing it. So we desperately need to have this for you, for the CLL community. And I think we're going to see emerging data out of the big sequencing studies. We're putting this together along with the clinical data to help inform you know, when you need treatment and what is the best treatment. And then on the completion of that, how well is the treatment done? Are you, you know, uh, have we eradicated you know, the, the disease? And you know, can we look at, you know, with, with our modern treatments, you know, can we start using you know, the cure word? So uh, thank you for listening to me. I probably over -taught my time around uh, any questions. Just thanking, I mean, our lab is, we have funding out of uh, LBC and just thanking Stefan who helped me with some of the uh, the slides and that just the rest of our group. So thanks. Oh, great, Peter. Really good. <laughs> and we all know how tough it is to fit a three-volume textbook into 20 minutes, so it's important, but that was great, Peter.
I think we'll defer questions to your point to put it here. Uh, we don't want to run out of time. So the next speaker is Dr. Gillian Corbett, who's a haematologist from Waikato Bay of Plenty with lots of experience with CLL. And Gillian's going to talk about um, treatment. Thank you, Gillian. Have we got the... Here we are. Quite, <laughs> quite tricky to put that on. Right now. Oh, yeah, it's a bowl. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, I'll come over here. And yeah, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity. I feel very grateful and honoured to be able to speak to you tonight. And I'd like to acknowledge my colleague and friend, Dr. Neil Graham, who's, um, who's organised this meeting and for the wonderful work he's doing to try and improve the outlook for patients with CLL in New Zealand. And I think, you know, he's, he's a wonderful person. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. So I'm just going to talk about the management of CLL in New Zealand at present, a little bit of a wish list as well. So I've probably been around quite a long time and I've seen a fair amount of the evolution of CLL treatment. Um, and I think it's been amazing what's happened in the last 10 years, particularly back in the 1960s and 70s, there were just these drugs called Carambisul and Cyclophosphamide, which are what we call alkylating agents, they are quite toxic on the, uh, potentially toxic on stem cells and not so effective against lymph nodes, quite useful in reducing blood counts in patients with CLL. Fludarabine came along in the 1980s, that's called a purine analogue. Um, it's a more specific drug against uh, CLL lymphocytes and that actually started to improve progression-free survival more for patients with CLL. This was combined in the 1990s with cyclophosphamide and better results were happened through that era, but nothing dramatic. But then in the 2000s, we started getting the anti-CD20 antibodies and you'll probably may have heard all of you of rituximab or Mabthera, which is the an most commonly used antibody. And these target an antigen or called CD20, um, <coughs> that's on the surface of the lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes. And so it was shown to be very useful, particularly combined with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. Bendamustine was the other drug that was de developed in that era, and that was developed in Germany. It's a combination of purine analog and an alkylating agent. And again, an effective drug improves progression for survival. But in the 2010s plus, we've now got next generation antibodies. We've got Ofatumumab, Obinutuzumab, which are more potent than Rituximab. And we've got these new targeted drugs such as Ibrutinib and Venetoclax. So for tonight, I'm going to be talking about the moment at the present. So I'll talk about really what's available in New Zealand, particularly at the present time and say why we do what we do. So the, why do we watch and wait with patients with CLL? Well, Peter's told you how some patients have nasty CLL and some have very mild CLL. And in fact, some patients never need, need treatment for it, even if it's a bit beyond monoclonal lymphocytosis. We also know that you cannot cure this condition or it's very unlikely that we're curing it. So maybe if we could cure it, we would just be rushing in to give you drugs early on, but there's no advantage to do that at the moment. I'm not talking about the future, perhaps so. And some patients will, so will remain stable for a long time and not progress without treatment, without treatment. The average age of presentation, as Peter also said, is quite old in the 70 to 75 age group. And so you have to think about treatment carefully. You have to think how toxic it is, what long-term effects it may have, what damage to the bone marrow can occur. So we always have to think of this before we initiate any form of treatment as well. The indications, this is from the International work, Working Group on CLL. Um, this is their recommendations for treating people with CLL. And that's significant anemia or low platelets, uh, significantly enlarged spleen or lymph nodes. If the lymphocyte increases more than 50% over a two month period, now it's important we talk about lymphocyte doubling, but it's important to realize we're not just talking about the lymphocyte count increasing from five to 10. It's 
from 30 to 60 or higher. So if it doubles over less than six months, it's not one of the strongest indications for treatment, but it's something that makes you start thinking about it. The other thing that people with CLL develop are antibodies directed against their own red cells and their platelets. And this is called autoimmune hemolytic anemia or autoimmune thrombocytopenia. And this can be a, a jolly nuisance for anyone with CLL. And I'm sure some of you may have experienced that. Um, and we normally treat it with steroids, but sometimes these are not effective. And then we have to look at more um, CLL directed therapy. Occasionally other organs can be involved, such as the spine or kidneys, and that would also be an indication to consider treatment. Then you've got the constitutional symptoms, or what we call B symptoms, unintentional weight loss, drenching night sweats, fevers, and significant fatigue. So these are the recommendations for treatment, although it may vary a little bit from one situation to another. And also depending on the desire of patients to be treated. You know, there are some patients who are not going to be treated, whatever you say to them. But, um, you know, it's, it's a, a discussion between the clinician and the patient, of course. So I'm supposed to remove the slide now, but the staging systems still, we do talk about them in studies and things. And for the simplistic amongst us, the BNA system is probably the easiest. It's easiest to remember. Um, and that's divides into A, B, and C. A, if you're anemic, if you're not anemic or, or not significantly anemic and you have a reasonable platelet count and you have fewer than three enlarged nodal areas. And by an enlarged nodal area, we mean neck under the arms, what we call axillary groins, liver spleen, Peter showed you before. Um, to become a stage B disease, you need to have greater or equal to three enlarged areas. And for stage C disease is when you have anemia and low platelets. And that's not due to antibodies, not autoimmune. That is because your bone marrow is infiltrated. So if there's some concern about what the cause of your low hemoglobin or low platelet count, sometimes you need to have a bone marrow to work out whether it's due to the disease or due to an immune cause. Now, the International Working Group's recommendation of testing before treatment, um, we, bone marrow is generally not indicated, but just in that situation I just mentioned for low blood counts, it can be useful to see how extensive the disease is. Um, CT scanning, not always, but certainly if we're going to start for Netoclax, we're recommended to um, do CT scanning to evaluate the size of the glands, not only the ones we can feel with our fingers and our tape measures and our the rulers or whatever, <laughs> or our imagination, um, but also to actually evaluate the size of the nodes because that can influence the way we use the venetoclax, how much fluids we give, whether they need admission to the hospital. Um, as Peter said, mutational status. I was just asking Peter when he was going to come up with a test for this. <laughs> He's looking away, <laughs> but <laughs> we'd love it. Um, but yeah, it's difficult and it's a very, very difficult test to establish. It's um, in fish, we've talked about fish and 17P particularly and PP53 mutation. Very important to test for these because it makes a difference to how we would want to treat and to prognosis. Um, so what are the funded options in New Zealand at present? For our younger, fitter patients, and you look at, you know, if you're up to 70, generally you can be considered for FCR treatment, depending on your physiology, how well you are, how strong you are. Um, but this is the standard treatment, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab. Now the fludarabine and cyclophosphamide is usually given orally, but can be given intravenously in certain situations. And as I said before, fluidaridines are curing analog and targets lymphocytes and cyclophosphamide is one of these alkylating agents. <coughs> then we've got rituximab, which is the monoclonal antibody. And this is given an, an infusion once a month as part of the treatment. Treatment generally lasts up to six months. That's what the government has decreed and has funded rituximab for that length of time. So the mode of action of rituximab, it works through either antibody-mediated cell destruction or through activation of a process called complement, where the, this series of proteins 
condition the cell to be broken down. And the actual process of cells breaking down, you may have heard of, is called apoptosis. We always have fancy names for everything. <laughs> <laughs> but that's cell death or apoptosis, and it works mainly through complement activity. Um, so the progression pre-survival for people on fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, and this is the work of the Germans. The Germans, were, it's sort of funny, the French are very good at myeloma, and the Germans are great at CLL, doing wonderful studies, and they did this original study back um, in the 2000s, and they showed that the progression pre-survival for patients who were receiving FCR, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, was better than those receiving fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. But then when they looked at their data, in fact, what they found is if you were mutated, you did better. If you're unmutated, you go down into the garbage dump a bit, unfortunately, you're down here. Um, this is so there's not much difference between FCR and FC if you're non-mutated. You get to where the mutated suffer if they receive FC alone. So FCR, very good for mutated people. And we, they wonder, in fact, if some people are cured in the study. We just don't know. You have to wait a bit longer, but now you're looking. This is, was published two years ago, and that's eight years follow-up, and there are people surviving free of disease with FCR. So it is a good treatment, but it's good treatment if you're mutated. And that's a bit over 50% of people are mutated. What about our older patients? Well, now we have bendamustine and rituximab funded for our older patients. And as I said before, bendamustine is a combination of a purine analog and an alkylating agent. Both of these drugs are given by intervene intravenously and the bendamustine for two days once a month. It's funded for first line treatment for up to six months. Now it's better tolerated than FCR in old, older patients. That's why it's given. When they've looked at this in younger patients, FCR is better than bendamustine and rituximab. But the risk is if you're older, your risk is of being knocked around far too much with this with FCR treatment. And that's why there is a restriction on um, you know, it's important to look at people's ability to cope with FCR before you use it. And this is again the Germans, they pub this is just a study they did which showed about, we're looking about three year 50% um, progression pre survival and a very good overall survival with bendamustine and rituximab. So it's a, a useful therapy, um, but probably not quite as effective as FCR. So what about our older patients? And when we talk about significant comorbidities, we're talking about things like renal dysfunction, heart disease, maybe immobility, and usually our 80 pluses. Um, sometimes our 80 pluses are really good and, and can take bendamustine and rituximab. And I gave someone well in their 80s FCR with the reduced dose and he managed very well. So, you know, you can't just evaluate people on age. It needs to be on how well they are. The caramdosol is given orally generally twice per month and the obinutuzumab by infusion once per month. And it's pretty well tolerated, this regime, and it usually lasts about six months. And why do we use this regime? Um, well, firstly, the obinutuzumab, this just shows you the different types of antibodies. You've got rituximab, which is more of a, what we call a complement or CDC activating antibody. And then you get to obinutuzumab, which is more of a direct killing antibody. And as such, it's a more potent antibody. And that's why it's useful for um, these older patients with CLL. It's, it, to this date, the government hasn't funded it for any other group of patients, however. And this is a study that was published in 2014 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And G is another name for, <laughs> just to confuse you, is another name for um, obinutuzumab. <laughs> so the combination, as you can see here, of obinutuzumab and carambucil produced a much better response rate than carambucil alone. And it produced a better response rate than combining carambucil with rituximab. And this just shows you some progression pre survival data from that study, where your progression pre survival for patients who received carambucil and rituximab was about 
15 months, that's a 50% progression free survival as opposed to, to a, about over two years for the obinutuzumab and carambucil combination. And that's why our government decided to fund obinutuzumab for our older patients, bearing in mind that they wouldn't tolerate the maybe more effective drugs, but it's still quite effective. So what about relapsed patients? If they've had previous FCR, you may consider using it if they relapse after three years. I don't, some people may not want that, but <laughs> so they've had enough, but um, it is an option and it certainly can work in that situation. But now we also have venetoclax available, available for patients who relapse within three years. We could also consider carambucil and obinutuzumab and we can also consider trials, clinical trials. And it's important to ask your clinician if there's a trial available in your area. We've been in Tauranga, we've been involved in trials looking at derivatives of ibrutinib, calibrutinib, xanabrutinib, and comparing them to ibrutinib. And so there are trials out there, and it's important just to think about that, um, the availability in your area or somewhere close by. So it's something you can always ask about if you have got relapsed CLL. So venetoclax and CLL. Venetoclax targets this protein called BCL2, which the BCL2 stops cell death or apoptosis. It's, it's a survival protein. And the venetoclax targets BCL2, causing the CLL cells to undergo apoptosis or cell death. This drug was produced, developed in Melbourne, so it's kind of local. Um, it's given orally and it's very effective, as Peter said, in patients with poor prognosis, such as the unmutated and those with deletion 17 and P53. So what's it funded for in New Zealand? It's funded for upfront management of patients with deletion 17 or P53 mutation. And as such, it can be given ad infinitum as long as it's working or for patients who relapse within three years of previous treatment, and in that situation, it's combined with rituximab for up to six months, and it's actually funded for two years. So it's generally quite a well-tolerated drug. Um, there is a risk of cell lysis. Um, by cell lysis, I mean a breakdown of cells when you start this treatment. Um, this can cause kidney problems, and so it's very important to monitor patients when they're starting venetoclax with lots of fluid and doing a lot of biochemistry measurements. So we're very strict about checking your biochemistry before you have the venetoclax, giving you fluids, watching it for the first 48 hours particularly. And we also build up the dose slowly. So the company is very kindly and <laughs> produced a nice pack that um, shows you exactly how to take it week after week until you get your maximum dose. So the Murano study was one that was initiated for Melbourne by John Seymour and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this just shows you progression-free survival in patients who received venetoclax and rituximab versus rituximab and pendamustine. So very favorable progression-free survival in this group of patients and generally well tolerated. So very good results. So what about other drugs? And I suppose you've all heard of ibrutinib and this was one of the original publications in the New England Journal of Medicine about um, using ibrutinib and relapsed CLL. Ibrutinib is, targets the um, BCR, BCR, sorry, B cell receptor signaling. It targets this thing called brutin kinase. Um, and the B, the B cell receptor is activated and this activates the cell to multiply, to survive and to develop, to, um, develop drug resistance. And by targeting BTK, we can actually cause this, or we can, we can inhibit this activity and cause the cells to die and not to be so, um, so aggressive in their nature. So it's a very effective drug. There are other targets, PI3 kinase, which um, there is also targeted therapy for. Um, the sick has not been so successful in being targeted, but there are other potential targets within this type of environment of the CLL lymphocyte 
So abrutinib, as I said, targets the B-cell receptor signaling. It's given orally, and it's very effective in patients with poor prognostic features, such as the unmutated and those with deletion 17. It does have some side effects. You have to be careful with an increased risk of bleeding because it inhibits platelet function and shouldn't be given in association with warfarin, um, but you can use some of the newer anticoagulants. Just have to be careful. Can cause atrial fibrillation in about 5% of patients. And you also have to watch for some interactions with other medications. But it's generally very well tolerated and quite an easy drug to take. Doesn't generally cause the cell lysis that you see with venetoclax. It's not funded in New Zealand. There are derivatives, as I mentioned before, which are more targeted and have fewer side effects, such as a calibrutinib and xanabrutinib. And there are also PI3K inhibitors, of which idelelisib is an example, which are also effective in CLL, but at present are not funded. So what about the results? Um, this is a study that's been, that was published from America, and this shows improved progression-free survival and overall survival in younger patients using ibrutinib and rituximab versus cludar versus FCR. Now, in fact, that result only applies to the um, mutated patients. Mutated results overlap, interestingly. We haven't got particularly long-term results, and that'll also be interesting to see. So certainly in the unmutated setting, the combination, of, well, ibrutinib is very effective and more effective than FCR. So what would be my wish list? Um, this is just what I think would be ideal. I'd like to be able to test for the heavy chain mutations, as I said before. And I'd like to have upfront ibrutinib or venetoclax. Nice drugs, easy to take, not many side effects. Um, and they are useful for this group of patients. You're unmutated, patients with deletion 17, the P53 mutations, and for your older patients. It gives your older patients more of a chance as well. And I've just put down the bottom, query combining ibrutinib and venetoclax. That's the big wish list, I suppose, and there are studies coming out, both in upfront treatment of CLL and also in relapse, showing that this combination may be very effective, particularly in terms initially of MRD negativity, that's minimal residual disease. So that may be the way of the future. And even adding in a few infusions of obinutuzumab, some, there is a study looking at that as well. So that's the wish list. I'm sure it's a lot of your wish list too. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Again, I think um, if there is a burning question, I think you can have it, but the time is uh, getting quite the time. And uh, so I think that um, we will proceed to Rob Weinshaw's talk next. And Rob is a, hemo, a clinical hematologist from Wellington, and he's um, also involved in a lot of research at the Maligan Institute, and he's one of New Zealand's leading CLL researchers. So Rob's going to talk to us about um, future directions and priorities. Thanks, Rob. While we're pausing there, I'll just say that maybe we're going to go over 10 or 15 minutes here. So I think the talk was very good, and we'd like to have a few questions. And I think, therefore, we're going to be finishing a bit later. But um, you know, daylight saving time, and we'll be seeing daylight when we get home, I think. Hey, Rob. Thanks, Neil, and thanks very much to LBC and, uh, and CLRNZ to, to, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I thought I'd wear a bright shirt for the talk, but then Tim obviously beat me to it. <laughs> so um, I think he wins the award this time. But um, uh, congratulations to Neil for putting the talks together because actually I think, I think Peter and Julian, what they've just said, is, is, is it leads on really nicely. And I think the sequence of talks is very good. And I think we're all thinking the same sort of thing. So um, I'm going to talk about some future directions and priorities and perhaps follow on almost directly from what um, uh, Julian's final slide was. So um, have I got a pointer? Sorry. Let's just pop this. So um, I'm going to I'm going to just lead with what I'm going to say at the beginning. So what I think the priorities are, and and I guess 
Um, I think CLL NZ has an important role to sort of advocate for people living with CLL in New Zealand. And I think um, this is just a, a very partisan view of what I think the absolute priorities are, but I think, I think this really reflects what, what Peter and Gillian have been, just been saying. I think the absolute number one priority is a funded BTK inhibitor for people with relapsed CLL. And that's quite an urgent priority. And it's one that's only likely to become more urgent as I'll show you um, in a moment. I think the second priority is um, planning for a reform of frontline therapy so that we have a genetically directed therapy, as Peter was, was saying, and that we can pull out those people who are likely to really benefit from six cycles of fairly intensive FCR chemotherapy. And for those who are less likely to benefit from that, that we can give them treatment that they're more likely to get on well with. Um, and I think I, I just want to make a claim for preventing infections, because the thing is, with all these wonderful new drugs, uh, having fantastic results, but they're not preventing the infection risk in people with CLL. I know that's all on our minds at the moment. And then I'll just talk about some future concepts which might come in in the future. I'm going to touch a bit on immunotherapy, but I think that's probably not the most urgent priority for CLL right now. So for the first thing, now I'm sorry to show these um, pathways, but um, I had a couple of meetings with pharma because they were sort of trying to work through what to fund and where. And they like to think very much in terms of patient pathways among the treated uh, therapy, the available therapies that they fund. And the reality is a lot of people's treatment course doesn't follow these pathways because you, know, you may have uh, issues, side effects of a particular treatment, you may access a particular treatment through a compassionate access scheme or through a clinical trial. So it doesn't always work smoothly like this, but they like to think through what is the pathway of the funded and available therapies. And as Gillian said, the first thing we do is to say, well, does, is treatment really needed? And um, she went very nicely through what the criteria for doing that are. Most say the same at the moment. It's possible that as we move towards some of these uh, newer treatments with fewer side effects, we may ch those, those indications of treatment may change. They may become a bit looser, but at the moment they still apply. And then at the moment, what we do is we look at that gene that Peter talked about, TP53, both by the FISH test uh, and often by molecular sequencing. And then we look at whether there's a change in that gene. And that's because we know that if that gene is altered, that people's CLL is much less likely to respond well to chemotherapy. And at the moment, we can now give those people venetoclax. It drives our colleagues from Abdu mad because that doesn't actually have a license for this. Um, but uh, it's proved quite a useful option. I've certainly treated a couple of people with it in that situation. And it's, it's a very useful option because actually, um, prior to that, the, the, the pathway of funded treatments really sort of stopped here. And we really struggled and would scrabble around with getting compassionate access um, Campath, which is a drug we prefer not to use unless we really have to, uh, from, from, from Europe and things. Um, if, there's, if that's not altered, and that's for the majority of people, so maybe 90, 92%, um, then some form of chemoimmunotherapy, and as Julian said, whether it's FCR chemotherapy, if, if, if there's no reason not to give that more intensive treatment, it does still seem to be the best, or bendamustine and rituximab or abinutuzumab and carambosil. I'm not going to get into the details of those again. And then we look at whether it's relapsed and then cycle through chemoimmunotherapy if it's relapsed early, and if not, we move on to venetoclax and rituximab. So, uh, but the problem we have really is that we don't, we run out of funded options, um, you know, fairly early in this in this in this piece at the moment and i think this is where we struggle and you know many of you may have participated in trials i certainly know a lot of a large fraction of people with cll have participated in trials but it's a shame when we have to use, re repeatedly try and use compassionate access schemes and and clinical trials as the only mode of access uh, these treatments and, and we do try and do that and julian's done great work to, to bring lots of trials um to new zealand but we do need we do need some funded treatment options there especially as there are it's likely that we're seeing fewer trials of BTK inhibitors. And, um, and why do we need it? So as, as I think Julian showed this slide, venetoclax and rituximab we know is better than bendamustine and rituximab in terms of the rate of CLL progression. And these, for these, cap, they're called Kaplan-Meier curves, as each notch goes down, that's somebody's CLL in the trial progressing. It doesn't mean it died. The, the survival curve is actually a lot better than this, but it, but it means the CLL has progressed and needed next line of treatment. And the thing is that venetoclax and rituximab was funded in December last year. So we're, we're about here at this time point. And what you can see is that by the time we get to another year and then we get to the point where that two years of venetoclax runs out, it's actually two years and five weeks, I think, because you get the, the then, then you start, the, 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 the slope of the curve starts to deepen. And that's because the treatment stops at that point and then people that's where people are more likely to relapse so while at the moment there's re should, should be relatively few people who are proving refractory or resistant to uh, venetoclax and rituximab 
that, 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 that fraction of people is going to rise. And that's going to become urgent, I think, by early 2022. And uh, these things getting drugs funded, as we all know, takes a long time. <laughs> so we need to be planning for this now and work out what we're going to do now. Uh, and I don't know whether we'll have you know, relapse DTK inhibitor uh, trials in 2022. Many of the leading drugs have already had, been through those trials. And um, I don't know if Dylan's got another one lined up, but after the one that we're in finishes in the next few weeks, we, we, we're without trials in that space. So that's just quite urgent. Um, so the leading BTK inhibitors, the leading uh, drug is ibuprofenib. It's the first one, and uh, it's the one that, uh, and at least some people in this room are taking. It's an excellent, an excellent drug. And I would say actually all these drugs are excellent. They're oral. They're very well tolerated. I mean, compared to the idea of starting chemo immunotherapy, they're all very, very easy drugs to use. They do have side effects, and every drug it doesn't have to be a BTK inhibitor. It can be venetoclax. It can be chemotherapy. All these drugs, the most pretty much all of them, the most frequent um, serious side effects are infections. So just remember that, that that side effect remains, and I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, Abrutinib is approved in New Zealand. It is not yet funded. It's been funded in Australia for relapse CLL since October 2017, and I understand it's in the near future likely to be funded frontline um, in CLL as well. So, so that, that's a great drug, and it's one with which the, we've got the greatest um, cumulative, experience, cumulative experience, so we've got the longest follow-up. A calibrutinib I haven't used, Gillian has used, um, um, I understand. Um, uh, I believe AstraZeneca are putting in an application to MedSafe to have that registered at the moment or preparing an application. Um, it has been approved in Australia and, and the United States. It's taken twice a day, so it's more tablets. Um, uh, has so, few, few of certain side effects, but headaches can be an issue in the reported studies. Again, I don't have direct experience of prescribing it. And it's been funded in Australia since last month as an alternative to ibrutinib for people. Not so much for resistance, because the resistance mechanisms are similar, but more for people who are not tolerant of ibrutinib. Um, and then there's xanabrutinib, which has been used here in trials um, and, and um, uh, potentially in compassionate access. And um, that has similar side effects, perhaps a bit more neutropenia, a um, bit less atrial fibrillation or regular heartbeat. It's approved only for the US, but only for a different type of, of lymphoproliferative disorder called mantle cell lymphoma. Um, so it's not approved for CLL yet, but um, certainly uh, many people in New Zealand have, have used it. And a lot of the initial studies also have actually been done in Melbourne, although it's developed by Beijing, which is a Chinese company. So what that, that's the current pathway where we, we, we run low on the Pharmac funded options quite early on. And really what we need to see is uh, um, venetoclax or ibrutinib um, for the people who have a T53 mutation early on, and then the ability to swap to the other if someone's intolerant of one drug or resistant. Because the good thing about using venetoclax or ibrutinib is they both work via quite distinct mechanisms. They both hit different pathways within the cell. So if somebody's resistant to one, they usually respond really well to the other and vice versa. Um, uh, and if necessary, it could be a different drug, BTK inhibitor of mybrutinib, but I think it is an urgent need. Um, and at relapse, again, we could have the same thing as an alternative to venetoclax with rituximab um, or at, at progression, then switching on to ibrutinib or another BTK inhibitor then. So that's what we're trying to do through trials at the moment, but that ain't going to last forever. And we really need this. And I think this is the most pressing priority right now. Um, Priority two, I think, is what, what Peter was alluding to about reforming for frontline therapy altogether. And then and Jenny mentioned this as well. And the two bits, I'm not going to try not to say too much data, are, are well, I'll start on the right, actually, that when you're talking about relapse CLL, uh, just giving, uh, sorry, upfront CLL in people who aren't suitable for FTR chemotherapy, just giving ibrutinib as a tablet daily uh, leads to better uh, progression free survival and giving combination chemoimmunotherapy. And certainly, this is a lot easier. Uh, 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 to take, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to prescribe as well, actually. You can prescribe, give someone some blood test forms and say, I'll see you in three months, maybe I'll give you a call in four weeks to check you're doing okay. I mean, it's great, it's been great during COVID to have people on ibrutinib and similar agents because uh, you can just do everything by telephone <laughs> consultation almost, to be honest. So uh, it certainly would be a great option to have frontline therapies, I think, all round. Um, for people where we're trying to get really, really deep remissions, and perhaps where we're willing to put it with a bit more toxicity for a deeper remission for people who don't have other illnesses, that combination, as Gillian talked about, of ibrutinib with venetoclax seems to work really, really well. And uh, we've seen some data on the responses. And what I'll just highlight is that by the time we got into 18 months of combination treatment of ibrutinib with venetoclax, 
about maybe 70% of people have no detectable minimal residual disease in the bone marrow. That's using assays such as those that Peter talked about where like flow cytometry, you cannot detect residual disease in the majority of people after 18 months of treatment. And you don't get that with a BTK inhibitor. You get that with a BTK inhibitor on its own. It's not potent enough to do that. And even when you give FCR chemotherapy, only perhaps a third of people get to that minimal residual disease negative remission. So this is fantastic. What we don't have yet is really long-term data that tell us if some of those people are actually cured or not. And um, as Julian said, you know, those, those initial trials of FCR chemotherapy reported in 2008, 2010, uh, we only just now have that 10, 12 year follow-up that we can actually look at to get a feeling that people might be cured. But nonetheless, I think there's enough to say that we should at least have a concept in mind of a medium term goal for a reformed frontline therapy. And this is one concept of what it might look like. We might take people whose um, <coughs> leukemia needs treatment and say, are they fit for these more intensive therapies? And that's not a commentary, an adverse commentary on your, your, your ability to run a certain distance at the gym, but it might be a com combination of factors, uh, which might include age, but are more likely to include sort of biological features such as other illnesses, um, perhaps kidney function and so on. And if you think that um, there's rationale in giving really a quite intensive therapy that might carry a higher risk of infection, higher risk of toxicity to the goal of getting rid of every last leukemia cell, then you could go down the route of doing this sort of slightly more sophisticated genetic testing. As Peter was saying, looking at this particular um, immune globulin heavy chain mutation, do, looking at TP53. And if you do that, you'll identify about 40% of people in whom FCR is likely, more likely than not, to be curative. So uh, about, uh, of those 40%, uh, about, uh, you can get just over 50% 10-year um, progression-free survival. I'll show you the curve in a moment. And for those people, it really would be worth battling through six cycles of FCR chemotherapy. And for those of you who've had it, a lot of people do describe it as a bit of a battle, particularly by the time we're looking at, at cycle five or six. And some people have course have life-threatening infections. So it is, it is serious and you want to make sure you're going to give it to the people who will most benefit from it. Um, for those for whom that's not likely to be curative or whose uh, CLR relapses, then I think this idea of giving a sort of perhaps even a fixed duration therapy with a BTK inhibitor and venetoclax is a really nice one. And the reason that, at least in New Zealand, we tend to be quite keen on fixed duration therapy. I think, I don't, I'm not any, I don't have any inside knowledge of, 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 of pharmacy but I think they do worry about the long-term cost of people faring very well and being on an expensive drug for a very long time. So I think when they say the long-term data are not mature, they don't mean that there's no demonstration of benefit, but the, the concern is that the cumulative cost may become very high. And I think going for fixed duration therapy, at least in some people, might be a more palatable concept. Um, so if you, if you, if you um, did that, so this, this, this group, uh, probably about 40% of people suitable for intensive therapy could have um, FCR chemotherapy. This is a separate series to the one that Gillian showed. This is the MD Anderson series, which has quite a lot going out to more than 13 years. And when, with these, with these progression-free survival curves, as well as the, the, the difference between the, the what we're looking at is when the curve plateaus, when it levels out, that's a sign that potentially those people are cured when the curve becomes flat and you stop seeing people relapsing. So I think maybe there's a situation where for a fraction of people, six cycles of FCR is curative, and we can identify those people much better. Uh, and those that have, that have this particular sequence, it's very, very unlikely to be curative. So that's where really that would be worth doing. Um, and I think what we could do is find that three quarters of fitter patients will either be cured by FCR or enter a really deep remission and be able to stop uh, this fixed duration therapy. And for the one in a quarter whose um, leukemia is still there when we look at the sensitive tests, for example, in the bone marrow, you might then look at giving maintenance therapy with an ongoing BTK inhibitor. And that's something I think could be palatable. I think, I think um, as, as with the competing drugs, uh, it, that's something that uh, pharma may want to be looking at. Uh, for those that, that, where that's not an option, then either perhaps just a BTK inhibitor, such as ibrutinib or one of the other ones, or potentially fixed duration treatment with abinutizumab and venetoclax, which I'm, I haven't really discussed in detail at the moment, but is one possibility instead of the carambacil and is shown to be better than abinutizumab and carambacil, and then at relapse perhaps go back to the, go to the other option. So that would be a great, com a great combination. That would really be what I think a lot of people in the CLL field think would be possible. But there are equivalents. You could use different drugs. You could perhaps add in. Uh, CD20 antibodies, as Gillian mentioned, but that would be a great vision to have and to move towards. Uh, I think the biggest hurdle probably is the Pharmac funding. Uh, yes, uh, the, the, these gene studies would need to be set up, but I think 
I think, to be honest, that's surmountable. And to be honest, what we've tended to do, um, uh, 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 or what Peter's tended to do is, once a drug becomes available where we can utilize those results to decide treatment, we'll probably respond quite quickly by developing the test because we'll be incentivized to find that test. It's, the problem is doing these tests now is that we can't do anything with the information <laughs> except frustrate us and you. Um, and then also minimal residual disease will be needed. Uh, priority three, preventing infections. So um, just to, this is a conceptual thing. So those of you who've had chemo immunotherapy like FCR will know that we give you these cards and we go on any fevers straight to the hospital, rush in, we'll get you straight in antibiotics. We're really worried about neutropenic infections for that, those months of the chemotherapy. And, uh, and we have this high risk of, of, of short-term infections. Then you get this sort of tail of opportunistic infections, which go on for maybe a year or two afterwards, after which the infection risk drops again. So that's what we tend to have. That's the paradigm what we're using now with FCR chemotherapy. But as we're using these new tablet agents, some of which we continue long-term, it's perhaps a bit different. We get less of those early infections. We don't get those severe neutropenia. Well, even if you get the severe neutropenia, people don't usually get bad infections. But what you do get is you get an ongoing loss of immunity over time and certainly places that have had these newer drugs available for longer are seeing that maybe people who've been on these drugs for five seven years there's a significant risk of infection which doesn't go away in fact possibly even deepens with and we need to understand management risk better and um, so that's something that i think is going to be more of an emerging problem the further we get into the use of these drugs um, i think it's important uh, there are a few things that we could do here i think it's important to vaccinate before uh, not after CLL therapy, if you possibly can. Uh, uh, influenza vaccine is something we can do and is funded. And often I'll try and get people, if, if, if people's see treatment is falling at around the time of influenza vaccines coming up, I might try and jostle the vaccination along or um, quickly get them before treatment. Uh, pneumonia vaccination is recommended in a lot of guidelines. Um, strange, strange scenario with the way it's Pharmac funded in that we can give one of the, the first uh, vaccine um, pre-chemotherapy, that's Pharmac funded, but the booster dose is not funded until you've had chemotherapy. But once you've started treatment, that's not, you don't respond as well to vaccines. So that's a minor thing that shouldn't have much of a cost implication, but it'd be worth correcting. And um, a lot of you will have asked your clinicians or nurses about, Zos about um, Zoster vaccination, the Zostavax against uh, shingles. Um, and the problem is it's a live vaccine that actually contains a live virus that can cause cause disease directly in people with CLL and the guidelines say not to use it. But there is a, there is a new version that's available in the US, although not here yet, um, that would be great to have that should be safe to give to people with CLL that could help re reduce the risk of shingles. And uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but we're doing some trials around immune globulin replacement. Um, so I, I think there's a bit of space to improve the vaccine availability, and that might be a simple measure that could help reduce some of those later infections uh, later on. So for example, Zostavax shouldn't be given to people with currently chemo lymphoma, and it's a real problem because you've got people who are most at risk of shingles can't have the vaccine, very frustrating. Um, and and uh, this newer vaccine called Shingrix uh, does appear to be safe because it doesn't contain any live virus. Uh, future treatment concepts. So, Something that um, I know um, people around the country are beginning to see is something that I've heard the Melbourne group term is double refractory CLL. And that's where people with CLL have become resistant to both metaclax and to BPA inhibitors. And here we struggle because there's two different molecular pathways in the cell that the, the, the leukemia has become resistant to. People by the time that at this point have also, the, the leukemia has also become resistant to um, chemotherapy at some stage. So this is a real problem. Uh, Sure, the standard would be to do a bone, a bone marrow transplant to replace the whole person's immune system, but that isn't, a majority, isn't an option for the majority of people with CLL um, because it's a very, very toxic procedure. Um, it's not something we, we really want to save that as a last resort. We, we, we can use some various combinations that we've got. There are a variety of new tablet-based agents that may be useful for this, and I know some of those are, are, are in trials internationally and may be entering trials here. Um, and then one of the exciting ways that's been trialed in New Zealand, both in Auckland and in Wellington, are treatments that redirect patients' T cells, redirect their immune system towards uh, the malignancy. Now, these are not ready for prime time in CLL. And they're not being trialed in CLL yet, but they may be in the future. And the two ways of doing that are by um, using a, a, an antibody that latches, directly connects the, um, uh, the leukemia cell to a, to a T cell. And so it's a bit like one of those antibody treatments, but it's basically bi-directional. Instead of being an an, just an antibody that binds to one thing, it's, it's a, a dual antibody that binds to two things. And the other thing is CAR T cells, where you actually genetically um, 
redirect patients' immune cells to direct them to their leukemia. And uh, broadly speaking, for the gene, gene redirection, we, we, we take patients a bit like a, a, a bone marrow transplant, take off some blood cells, uh, genetically reprogram the T cells in the laboratory, uh, grow them up in the lab, um, give a relatively low dose of chemotherapy. It's actually three rather than cyclophosphamide, but just like, but in fact, slightly lower doses than one cycle for CLL, and then give the cells into the blood, and then they proliferate and start uh, recognizing the malignancy as foreign. Um, we've been setting that up, and we've started a trial at the moment in lymphoma. Um, we, uh, what happens, I'll just say this video is taken by uh, Yasmin's candy being supported by LBC. Um, here we've got some control uh, leukemia cells that, that are, uh, do not have CD19 on the surface and the leukemia cells are in green they are markers and so you can see that over time the leukemia cells are growing and taking over and this is where um, the leukemia cells have the CD19 marker on the surface in both cases there are some CAR T cells in there and the leukemia cells instead of growing and growing and growing taking over with green form these large dying clumps of cells um, and so um, I won't go into this in detail, but we, we have established CAR T cell manufacturing. Um, some of the very earliest CAR T cell trials were in CLL, but to be honest, um, CAR T cell therapy is quite laborious and logistically difficult to deliver. And it's, um, uh, uh, it's, it's got some, it can have some significant toxicities. So it's not something that you'd want to do early in the course of CLL where simple tablets could control it very well and very safely. But it might be something that we have to look at in the future a bit more as we get people that are refractory to both venetoclax and to B, uh, BTK inhibitors. Uh, might also be useful for where CLL transforms with aggressive lymphoma. So to summarize, I think uh, absolute priority is uh, be at least one BTK inhibitor for relapse CLL. I'm saying at least one. Of course, as clinicians, we want more than one. We want a choice if somebody has a nasty rash to switch into a different agent. So that's, what, that's the scenario we have in chronic myeloid leukemia. It'd be great to reach that scenario with CLL. Um, it would be really great to reform frontline uh, CLL treatment to use some of those tools that Peter was talking about so that we can identify who's going to respond well to chemotherapy and target those treatments best. And then for those who are not going to respond brilliantly to chemotherapy, go on to more suitable treatments that are going to work better. Um, and then uh, I, I do think that there's, there's a growing issue around managing infection risk. And I haven't talked about it here, uh, but um, it'd be... Uh, really important and there's a lot of work going on to look at um, COVID risk with C, uh, CLL. Maybe that's something we can bring up in the discussion. So thank you very much. And in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Well, uh, Tim was going to get a, a free little purchase, I think, uh, up the front for these speakers. If you all come forward, uh, the three speakers, and we'll have um, about 10 or 15 minutes for questions and discussion. Um, it's now um, about five to seven. So, the, the, the question, the one question we had from out of town answered. <laughs> that was um, what about um, uh, um, uh, mutated with some mutated testing being available in New Zealand? Yeah, okay, so, so that's not that's available at the moment. No, but I think but it, you're working on it. It's a, I think it's a, it's a priority. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Okay, then. Well, uh, you got a seat there, Rob. Right? Oh, another one coming here. Right? Maybe. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so um, I think that's basically it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this mic here, so everyone, everyone can hear you. I um, mean, everyone can hear everyone inside the. Um, Inside the room, so it'll so, so be quiet here. <laughs> no rustling of lolly bags or anything like that. Okay, so um, questions. I would you like to start with the questions in the room or the questions online. Either. So we'll take one from the room and then one from online. Okay, room. fine. Yeah. So we'll take a question from the room. Um, what's needed to get the testing for the uh, line? Yeah, I think it's. Um, Part of it is one te technically it's a difficult it, it's not a straightforward assay to develop so we we've got a lot of expertise around molecular testing but this one is a complex assay uh, secondly is that the pharmac and the ministry around their funding of a lot of testing has been they, they fund the drug and then they look around can, 
companion testing sort of for it. And so it's all often about the, the wrong way. And this, this New Zealand doesn't have a, any national strategy around developing all this new genomic uh, for testing. So it really is reliant on a lab that has got and clinicians that that uh, you know that have got an interest in it and sort of push to get it developed. But I think there's enough pressure now, and because the data is so, uh, it's it's such a difference there for patients. So with private fund, private uh, a little bit of private push and funding help in that direction, or you mean like a private fund? Well, I mean by maybe through the organisation or blood cancer. If there was a um. It is, it's a model we've used for in the acute myeloid leukemia. So uh, a lot of the work in our lab is around genetic testing and, and acute myeloid leukemia. And that has been funded out of research funding and then we've developed as research projects and moved it into the clinic. I think this is a, an established enough test that it actually, they, and the laboratory at Auckland has got a lot of agenda to, um, to develop. I think it's probably more pressure from the and that's probably a way forward neil would be actually for both lbc and uh, uh clinz to be communicating with the you know with the laboratory and diagnostic genetics at, at auckland and saying hurry up right. the the other i would say i think public pressure would be good you know, yeah. it's, it's even a problem in australia actually where they don't have standardized funding even for the fish i think is even funded routinely and so hospitals have to pick up the bill directly so it's, yeah, it's a, comp a complex issue. Yeah. So we've got a, yep. a question from Cyberspace. Cool. So um, also, if you're in the room, if you can speak up because the speaker because the mic's here, and then everyone online, we've got about forty people online that can Ooh. hear you as well. Oh, <clears throat> um, so just from um, just from Zoom, how so? How soon after diagnosis should we find out where we sit in terms of which deletion we are? And so I'll, I'll pick that up. So the, the FISH study, so first off is that if different clinicians vary and and, and uh, Jenny and Rob may want to comment as to whether they do FISH on everybody at, at the initial diagnosis or, or leave it and wait until patient needs therapy. I tend to do it on patients who have got, uh, and who are diagnosed with CLL and got a clear sort of diagnosis. Normally that investigation is done on a peripheral blood sample and it may vary around the country, but that should be around a, a sort of about a 14 day sort of turnaround time. So it sort of depends on the lab. I, I tend to wait until patients, uh, it looks like someone's needing treatment. Because um, even, even if there is a 17P deleted clone, if it's a small clone, uh, some people were you know, still following up 10 years later. And it, it really, the, 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 that, 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 that gene change mostly comes into, into being when you know, you're going to start selecting for that clone by giving if you give chemotherapy. But um, but yeah, I, I, um, I there's considerable variation. I think. I agree with you. I, I would tend to do a treatment time. Certainly should be done live treatment, even if it's been done before. But it, it is a bit tricky because you, you sometimes the turn if the turnarounds are long. Sometimes you get you do and then actually the CLL sort of stay stable for and you find you're not treating until two years yeah, later. That's right. But, that's um, when you but, need to recheck that yeah, have evolved. Yeah. You know, you yeah. have this evolution of genetics. Do you think though, would you have a different view though, is that because if you if you take that information along for clinical staging and uh, yeah, and you had your, your IG mutation status, then that, that gives you information then that you could provide to the patient and their family of, of on a on the CLL IPI score or the recently published uh, CLL predictive score for how for what the likely time is, you know, so, so between I mean because many patients don't need treatment, but the question that I can get asked, well how you know what is the time frame you know and because you're often you're, you're a single point of time so you don't know is this someone who's going could sit like this for another five years and we've all got patients that are sitting like that for 10 years or is this someone who mm, you got to watch quite quickly i think if we had the igvh mutational like status that might maybe yeah because i think then then you can actually yeah um uh, also the IG, igvh mutational status doesn't change over time whereas the tp53 mutation status yeah. can and um a small clone can get much larger over time, become more significant. So you could find this, yeah. But yeah, the IGBH mutational status that be stable should be stable for an individual throughout the course of their CLL, unless they unless they have a second CLL clone, which is a pretty rare. But yeah, um, I think I think I think it's an evolving field. Really. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Right, um, it's, it's the room's chance for a question. And I, it's something that what Peter partly alluded to is the cause of this disease. We don't really know the cause of it. Um, we understand familial tendency in some groups. And you mentioned some genetic abnormalities that can predispose to development, but other exogenous uh, phenomena that we still don't understand that might be the basis to CLL. I mean, that's important for, you know, for treatment and for understanding etiology, for example. Shalene, you got um, I, I think I'd like Peter, I don't think there's anything obvious, so I do understand that they have actually given compensation to people who have been exposed with, to Agent Orange with CLL. I understand that it was on their list of um, things they'll compensate them for, but I don't know if it's been proven. But mm. And Peter, Peter mentioned the horticultural industry, which does seem to be a New Zealand specific, well, actually it's been seen in other countries, but there, there's some nice research from Massey around that and um, they've run, we've run a project with them where they're looking for low level CLL clones for monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis in people who work in the horticultural industry and that's sort of be pest, certain pesticides. The problem being actually that if you could take people in rural central North Island it's very far, hard to find anybody who hasn't used a fair amount of Roundup in their lifetime mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the, the, one of the issues of that study was actually finding a control group. <laughs> 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 the issue with those studies is those <laughs> epidemiologic studies and so what they look for is an association. Yes. They don't look for a cause of effect. And yes, so that, that's the issue with it. And then if you've got an incidence in the population over 60, if you look hard enough, 5% of, uh, of normal individuals have got a monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. So that's a really, it's a, from a, it's a really hard question to, mm -hmm. to solve. So what the epidemiology does uh, is inform, it creates a hypothesis that then you can test. So you may, so you can test that so it's interesting, like um, in the US, Monsanto has been taken to court over Roundup and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. But if you had diffuse large B cell lymphoma and tried to go to ACC to get compensation, could you use Roundup? There's that the, the data is not strong enough to, for that for that link. So there are associations, but we you know we definitely. I th I think the area that's interesting is that. Why are the different? What's the different racial uh, and uh, Western countries? I think that's and and so this is this is a condition that we see in 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 Western developed uh, sort of country that we know you know, the um, with the with the mutated gene that there must be particular antigens that are exposed. So I think the clue is something is in there, it must be in there around its, its etiology. Which Asians have more mutated than non Asians have got um, I'm not I'm certain, sorry. Yeah, just Obviously, if people live longer in Western societies generally as well, it might be a factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, another uh, very simple question. Um, can you pay privately to get a TP 53 tests done in Australia and a rough idea of the cost? Uh, so, I'm wanting to so the question is, can we get it, can you get a TP53 sequencing done in New Zealand? Uh, in, in Australia. Australia? In Australia. Oh, yeah. I think it's really available. I would, uh, it's, actually, no. Australia's got this funny funding system for genetic testing. So, I don't want New Zealand, they're getting it sent overseas. And they just asked if you can um, get it done. So, so, I mean, my understanding is that within the hospital system, it's around $400 in the billing for sequencing people. But that, that, there is a necessity for someone to isolate the DNA first and ship it. I don't know how that works for private testing. I think that may mean the mutation test, which you can't get here. Can you go to a yeah, IGBH mutation paper test. over there? Yeah. So the TP53 we can do, we'll do here. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. available. So so the algorithm we use is um, CLL cells come into peripheral blood. We'll do the fish testing, and so if if it's negative on on fish for the, the 17 p deletion, then we'll go forward and extract the DNA and, and sequence that for TP53. If it's if it's got if it's popular by fish, then we we don't we stop at that point. Um, the the immunoglobulin gene rearrangement uh, mutate so the mutation status. I think Peter Mack is the only centre and anyone I'm aware of. Yeah. They're, they're doing it, and there was I, I don't know the cost, and there were, the last I heard there were quite significant delays uh, with it as well. Mm -hmm.
Right, a question from the room. Yeah, I've got one. Um, first of all, thank you for giving your time to come along tonight. It's um, very informative and gives me uh, great hope. So the question is, um, with the drugs that are not funded in New Zealand, but are funded in Australia, is Pharmac kind of um, sympathetic to funding going forward, or is, is it... I, mean, how hard I think they recognise that there's a need yeah. So the very first time they looked at ibrutinib, it was not rated as a particular priority. But then they definitely have recognised it as a priority. I think a medium priority. I think the issue, the there's a fixed bucket of funding. It's a unique system where there's a certain amount of funding to buy all the pharmaceuticals for the entire population for a year, and um, that that funding has to be covers everything from vaccines to to, to anti-cancer drugs to uh, drugs for arthritis. Um, it, it, yeah, it's it's it, it's a it's a system that probably gives, brings good value to money. I think many people would argue that the quantum of funding is not what maybe we might be expecting. It's more similar to Mexico or Poland than it is to Australia or the UK, for example. That's true. It's true. If you look at per capita funding mm -hmm. in New Zealand for pharmaceuticals, it is it is on the on the ballpark of the Mexican and and uh, and and, uh, and Polish funding. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. I'm not sure I blame Pharmac at all because I think it's just a consequence of the amount of dollars available. But, yeah. Probably the more that they become aware of the drug like that, the more they may assume as well on finding patient advocates are very important. The, I have, uh, I mean, it's certainly like, I guess the main one is really what we, what we really need in terms of for our, for our patients of the group. I, um, the, the rumor I heard is that it's being, I think they're looking at it again and looking, looking that something's going to happen. Does look that way. Yeah. yeah. So I don't need to schedule that into my retirement fund. Good <laughs> 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 I think also another, you know, and um, Helen, I don't want this to be the end of our friendship. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, I think there's a responsibility. We, we focus on farming. But we, we don't focus on the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, these drugs are a horrendous uh, cost. Mm. And you look at how, how, how are these drugs funded? And I, as co-author of it, we wrote a paper on funding of drugs for chronic myeloid leukemia that was published in Blood, in blood about 10 years ago. And, and basically, in the, you, know, you say, how, 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 are drugs, how does a drug company decide what cost it will be? And, so a lot of my early research was on chronic myeloid leukemia, where the breakthrough drug was a matin of Gleevec, and that was originally funded in the US at thirty thousand dollars a year because the, the the drug that it was replacing was interferon, and that's about what that cost. And then in New Zealand, so it was fifty thousand dollars a year. So that was in two thousand and three we got that funded, and now we're onto a generic matin of that costs about two thousand dollars a year. In the US, they still don't have the generic. Uh, well, they do have the generics, but the, the, the drug, the company in the US has pushed that, that, that price of that drug up. So it used to be 30,000 US, it's now about 100,000 US a year for it. The generics are available and the generic companies are still charging a similar amount. You go over the border to Canada where the generic is funded and it's the same price as in, in New Zealand. So you've got to say, well, yes, some of the responsibility is, is with, with Pharmac. Well, I think you know, we are caught with this global pricing of, of drugs that, yes, these are companies that, that they have investors and they need to return uh, for, for those investors and drugs, uh, what, one out of 10 or one out of 20 that goes into a phase three trial makes it into the clinic, the others are negative. And so huge costs of bringing a drug from drug discovery into the clinic, but you have to ask, is it for a matter of $100,000 a year for, for 20 years? And so, yeah, I think there's, even in the US, there is a lot of debate you see over, can the US health system and their insurance funding bodies continuing to fund those drugs? Sorry, I didn't need to stand on my, 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 my soapbox for so long. <laughs> there, was a, there was a huge patient push for a matter of it. was really publicised on the television. It was enormous when it came into being. Um, so it was about 2001, I think, or 2003. 2003, about 
Tim, you have another question? Yeah, we've, got, we've got 11 more down. on here. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, well, we should finish in about <laughs> yeah. five or six minutes, I think. All right, um, so what's up? I'm, I'm sure you answered this. What's the prognosis following FCR treatment? I mean, the overall median prognosis is about four and a half years, I think. Yeah, and, but that's not a prognosis that's accurate for an individual person. That's, that's if you took, what it means is that in half of people, CLL is likely to come back at less than that time, and half people is likely to be longer. And as we don't do that IGBH mutational status at the moment, you know, we don't pick apart people's individual likelihood. But I think, it, it, I don't know, I think it's useful to, to give people that as a ballpark and say, look, if it gets to more than four and a half years or so, then that's great. And um, and if it relapses much sooner than that, if it relapses early, we've got an option as a backup. And I think with CLL, it's one of those conditions where it's always nice to know, to have a think about what the next line of therapy might be, because, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a chronic or long-term illness. And the idea, most of the paradigms of treatment um, for most people at the moment are, are, are living well with it rather than being unwell, so handling it as a chronic illness like diabetes that we can't cure either. And um, yeah, it's good to have the backup option available. And I do like to give people that confidence. All right, any questions? Yes, there are 11 questions waiting here. Okay. Um, so this is just for you, Gillian. Um, a slide showed where there was uh, less incidence of CLL in younger females. Is there any difference in prognosis or seriousness in younger 40 to 50 year old females? E.g. does age of diagnosis affect outcome? No, I suppose the only concern would be that if you are younger, you're more likely to need treatment at some stage. Um, and also it's psychologically very difficult for a young person to have to face a situation like that. But I've seen young people, I've seen people in their 20s presenting with CLL. I've seen people who have gone on for a long time and not needed any treatment. In fact, we just discharged a fellow from the clinic recently that I followed up largely because I was a bit nervous. He presented in his 30s and now 10 years later, he's just fine. So, no, I don't think there's any particular reason, but if they, I think if they went through Peter's battery of tests and they proved to be P53 deletion, 17 or, you know, I mutated, they've got more chance of progressing. But I don't think there's any specific problem being a young female. It's just really tough. Cool. <laughs> yeah, another one. Um, how effective is the pneumonia vaccine? It's quite effective if you give the conjugate vaccine first, um, which is the piece the Prevnar. Um, there was a good trial, in, randomized trial in Sweden, and they compared the two vaccines. So it's quite bad. What it doesn't do is we don't think vaccine, vaccines work for about six months after rituximab. Um, one issue is we, don't, we think that even drugs like venetoclax and ibrutinib probably do have an impact on vaccine responses. Um, so if you give it early in CLR, it's meant to be effective. And we put that in our health pathway. Um, I'm not sure how often it gets adopted, but to try and vaccinate it. Some of the guidelines are to try and vaccinate early in the course of CLR rather than wait until there's a lot of immune suppression and then just give booster vaccines every five years. Um, there's, there's a slight issue with the wording of the funding criteria that I think is a bit of a shame around that, but um, yeah. Cool, and just follow up question from that was, um, I have had Prevenel works well. Um, he tried to pay $75 for uh, the new Avex, but there isn't any available in New Zealand. Is oh, that, I didn't know it? that. Oh. Okay. Well, if you've had the Prevenar, that's probably the more important one anyway, because okay. that's been shown to be more effective than the, so we usually use the Prevenar as the first one and the new vaccine booster. So I didn't know that. There, I think there's been a lot of demand on flu vaccines and other vaccines mm. because of COVID mm. at the moment. So maybe that's the reason. So I didn't know about that. Thank you. Cool. And you guys did talk about um, CLL having a familial um, trait. That, um, so the patient is asking if it's hereditary. CLL. Is CLL hereditary? Um, it's there is this familial linkage. So there is uh, what we see is that uh, that um, relatives of a patient who's got CLL have a higher risk than the general population than of developing CLL or similar sort of conditions. But it's not hereditary in the sense of a condition like. Uh, Huntington's disease, or I use the example there of, of the, mm. the BRCA1 gene where you can identify a gene 
and there's a fifty percent chance of inheriting that gene is still a very low risk in the uh, in the in the family members and relatives. Cool. Um, what what are the signs that the drug ibrutinib is losing its efficacy? And then you guys talked about this, but what other treatment options are available if it stops working? Well, we're now, we're now very fortunate we've got the metaclax, and the metaclax has been shown to be very useful in those sorts of patients. So usually the signs are that the patient's lymphocyte count is starting to increase. They may well be developing lymph nodes. Um, and certainly if the, um, you're going to start the metaclax, it's wise not to stop the operation straight away. It should overlap. Cool. Um, what is the overall survival rate prospect for CLL with 17p deletion? Um, if you if you look at the the the, um, the slides I show, it is it's a um, that that is the the um, worst outcome group. Those 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 curves though and that data all preceded these novel agents, so the brutin kinase inhibitors, uh, brutinib and venetoclax, and so that was with the conventional you know, therapy of FC or FCR, where intermediate survival was around uh, three to four years, and that. But I think now you know you'd be able, patient would be eligible for venetoclax or for a clinical trial with the brutinib or one of the BTK inhibitors. So. The, the, the prognosis improves sort of significantly, and I can't quote off the top of my head with the 70 p deletion on BTK inhibitor. Yeah, yeah, it does have some impact on on prognosis. Even people probably because it, possibly because it's a marker of more genetically complex disease. It's more prone to developing other resistance mutations rather than because of the effect on that gene itself. And um, my understanding is that in relapse CLR with with a BTK inhibitor, I think it's the medium PFS how many lines of therapy is around four years and it's more like two and a half to three if there's a 17 p deletion but um, the earlier you treat with these new agents in the course of the cll the better the outcomes because you haven't sort of um, selected for cll it's already become very genetically complex and diverse and um, and i think that's that's one of the issues that by the time somebody's had three four lines of different chemotherapy often the, the leukemia cells are not just one population but many populations and some of the populations might be resistant to a drug and then emerge over time and that's certainly a paradigm that's been seen with cll and with many well certainly with le of, of leukemias and, as well cool. last two questions um uh, having been in remission for three years what is research saying um we having to go through treatment again within the next few years um, second question relates to the infections and um, I know blood cancers, you have to be aware of infections, i.e. Oh, he's just asking about the immunity to fight um, different types of infections if he has to go back through um, more treatment. So, I mean, the, I guess the question of if the patient is in remission for that length of time, probably we don't uh, you know, a little bit would depend on what, what the initial treatment was, and then the, what, what we're going to get better at is, is, is um, Rob showed and Julian showed in their slides that is that patients that have got you know, the mutated immunoglobulin gene and that those you don't tend to see the T53 or 70p deletion in that group, then that predicts for a group that's going to be a more durable remission. And then now, if we add an MRD uh, analysis, and so is there a group? Where that where that curve, rather than you know continuing to drop down, flattens off, and that's what's come out of the the, the German leukemia study group and the MD Anderson, uh, and so is, is there a group that are going to have very long remissions there? And so we at the moment our paper, we don't have those we don't have that data and those that MRD and the immunoglobulin status to say that. But, yeah. To say to immunity, I think I think what I've been saying to people is once someone's two years out of FCR chemotherapy, I've tended to say that we think, I mean, I'm sure the immunity, if you look at detail, is not exactly the same, but I've tended to tell people to go back to living mostly as, as normal at that point. And in relation to, to COVID, I think anyone with a history of CLL, whether you've had treatment or not, should pay close attention to what the government recommendations are. And I think that, that there's some data from the UK where they've looked at um, risk of getting really severe COVID disease and um, uh, hematologic cancers were a risk factor 
and, and particularly if there's chemotherapy within the past two years. So I tend to use that as a time to be, you know, to really be particularly cautious. And I don't know whether we'll have international travel again, but if, if someone was in two years FCR, I probably would be saying avoid it until it's, you know, it's controlled internationally. So I think I think I think that is worth being aware of. And um, I would, I'm not sure I really know what the case is with BTK inhibitors or venetoclax to any huge extent. Interestingly, they're doing a study in Britain and as a COVID treatment. as a treatment for yes. COVID, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. interestingly, it's, mm -hmm. we don't know the results of that. But keep your vitamin D levels normal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. um, so, last question from someone who's living outside the main centre, uh, dealing with um, CLL can be really hard. Um, can they get an appointment with um, a specialist outside of their provincial centre where there is no specialist? Usually mm -hmm. some specialist um, providing outreach clinics in most centres or nearby centres. Um, most of the major centres in New Zealand provide some form of outreach. Yeah. So, so uh, one thing is a lot of because a lot of blood tests are very common and we're very good at detecting CLL with the technologies that Peter talked about, a lot of people have a diagnosis of very early stage CLL but don't have anything that indicates it needs treatment. And the, the, the common strategy in New Zealand is that those people are followed up by their GP in primary care. Um, and uh, it's really a way of managing. I mean, we're in a wonderful position where we've got better treatments for a range of malignancies, including CLL, but it does mean our clinics get busier and busier because it's not to say even if the number of people with developing CLL rises, it's if people with CLL now live in 20 years instead of five years, um, that then then that's four times as many people attending clinics. So if it does if, if it doesn't meet um, there's no particular reason that person might need treatment, they may be asked to see their GP. Otherwise, they should be able to be referred to, a, yeah. it should be, in all DHPs, there should be a haematology service that can be referred to, but it might involve traveling quite a long way, depending on how remote that person's community is. Yes, I think we use stage A CLL as a, um, a label for advising the GPs to look after the patients if we can evaluate that very early BNA stage. So I, I think we, just, we send out a standard letter from Tauranga and I don't know if you people do, but we just haven't got the facilities to see very early CLL patients in clinics. But I think if any of those people are really worried, they can also go privately to uh, And LBC has a nice leaflet about active monitoring, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which maybe you can send it to that person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. All right, well, I think that's, um, you know, it's almost half past seven. Um, I'd just like to um, say a few thank yous. Uh, I'd like particularly to thank our three speakers for the time that they've put into the talks and giving them and coming here. And I thought there were three fantastic talks. And hopefully uh, there's now a great resource uh, for CLANS and for LBC in relation to this being videoed. I'd also like to thank Tim particularly uh, and his team for all the effort they put into uh, making what was, I thought, an outstanding uh, session on CLL. And uh, uh, so I'd like to thank LBC and, and Tim particularly. So, and thank you all for attending. And I guess that you've enjoyed it and found it informative. And so I think we just give a round of applause.